Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center's first virtual version of America's Town Hall. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of the National Constitution Center, uh, which is right behind me, uh, sunny, gleaming with the cool light of reason. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. In fact, I'm home, but I, we have the beautiful backdrop to inspire us and to remind us of this great institution which has convened all of you so many times in person. And I'm so thrilled that you're joining us for this great uh, first installment of a rich virtual town hall series. We will bring you week after week, the greatest historians, constitutional scholars and thought leaders on all matters, historical and constitutional to explore the constitutional issues at the center of American life from the founding until today. I'm thrilled that we have tonight two of America's greatest historians of George Washington to discuss the constitutional legacy of Washington as well as his, uh, as well as two recent books. Um, and I'll introduce them in a moment. Uh, but before I do that, I need to ask you to recite along with me the National Constitution Center's inspiring mantra. Now, those of us who, are, those of you who are joining us for the first time may be slightly intrigued by this unusual ritual but the many of you who have come so often to join us in person know that we love to begin our shows at the National Constitution Center by reciting the inspiring words that Congress invoked when it created the National Constitution Center during the bicentennial of the Constitution as a private nonprofit. So here we go, I recite along with me at home. Uh, if your kids are in the other room, they'll, they'll know that you're doing something meaningful. And, uh, uh, and here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to, to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. What a meaningful mission that is, and that's exactly what we're going to try to do tonight by discussing the constitutional legacy of George Washington. I, you know, I also begin the shows by talking about the upcoming programs, and I have to share with you how exciting it is um, that every Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday at 1 p.m., I'm conducting a live class on the Constitution. It's pegged for high school and college students, so please sign up your students, your, your, your kids, if they're learning at home, and please join yourself if you'd like a refresher on the First Amendment, the Second, the Fourteenth, the Religion Clauses, which I had a great refresher on today uh, in prepping for teaching them. It's so meaningful to be able to interact with hundreds of kids across the country um, in this interactive way and thousands more online. And I hope you'll sign up. And tomorrow for a real treat that I would love you to join, um, I'm gonna have the honor of interviewing Ken Burns, the great uh, storyteller and American historian about the constitutional legacy of the American Revolution, the New Deal and the Civil War. And so that's 1 p.m. tomorrow. You'll find the link at the National Constitution Center's live stream page and hope to see you there. Okay, it's now my great pleasure to put on my constitutional reading glasses. You can tell I'm actually not outside because I've got to put them on in order to uh, do the introduction um, and introduce our wonderful guests tonight. Uh, Lindsay, Ch uh, Lindsay Chervinsky is White House historian at the White House Historical Association. Uh, she is the author of the new book, The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American institution. Uh, she is widely published. I had the great pleasure of interviewing her recently on the We the People podcast, and I can't wait to share her work and her insights with you. Uh, Lindsay, welcome to America's Town Hall. Thank you so much for having me. And Edward Larson holds the Hugh and Hazel Darling Chair in Law and is University Professor of History at Pepperdine University. Uh, he is a recipient of the Pulitzer Prize in History. He's the author or co-author of 14 books, uh, several of them on George Washington and the founders. And his newest book is Franklin and Washington, The Founding Partnership. Ed, it is wonderful to welcome you back to the National Constitution Center. Thanks to be, thanks you so much for having me back there, if, if even only virtually. Well, it is just great. And I'm so eager to learn from both of you and with both of you in the spirit of Louis Brandeis. Come, let us reason together, let, let the learning begin. Okay, um, and I, let's begin with you because you have this uh, 
powerful pairing of the two founders you consider the first among the founders, Washington and Franklin. You note that they are labeled first and second in the most famous portrait of the Constitutional Convention and were often considered foremost by uh, their contemporaries. Uh, you develop so many parallels among them, including their shared support for strong central government, the friendship that they cultivated uh, during the battles of the over the French and Indian War and their opposition to the Stamp Acts and, and during the colonial era and of course at the Constitutional Convention. But you also note a, a shared quality in both of their characters and that is their devotion to a, a, a Roman and almost stoic conception of virtue. Uh, both said in different ways that, the, uh, that a government cannot succeed without a virtuous people. They believe that happiness is impossible without virtue and virtue is necessary for a successful government. So, uh, and, and, and they got that from Stoic sources. Franklin uh, read uh, Pythagoras's golden rule, as well as being a, an avid reader of Socrates and, and Washington's favorite play was, was Cato by Joseph Addison, which he had read to the troops at, at Valley Forge. So the, the, the Stoic conception of virtue is not familiar to our modern ears. Tell us how, uh, Washington and Franklin understood virtue and why they believed that it was crucial to the success of Republican government. Well, first we must realize that at the time, a continental republic was literally something new under the sun. That was the motto, something new under the sun. There wasn't any examples of a effective continental republic. And there were very few republics, maybe Switzerland, maybe Venice. There wasn't very much going on, but they could look back to ancient Rome before, before the empire and see a republic. And they looked, they studied both men. Both men, you've got to realize and remember, both were self-made men. Both were, by the time of their, their death, certainly by the time of their prime, they were literally the most famous Americans and the most respected Americans both here and throughout the world. They had come up, especially Franklin, from literally nothing, from being an indentured servant, uh, a refugee as it was to Philadelphia, to become one of the wealthiest men in Philadelphia, a true success through his business. Washington is the same sort of success story. He didn't, he wasn't born into everything. He, he inherited some, but he worked hard to create it. And they were creating something new and they looked over to Europe and they saw a few leaders and Franklin knew a lot of those personally because he'd spent so much time in Europe and he realized they were decadent. And then he looked at the people and the people were like sheep and they wanted to create something new. They were both children of the enlightenment and they wanted to create this new thing. They wanted to create a, a, a government of the people. That's what Washington wrote in the draft first inaugural, a government of the people. Lincoln later borrowed it, but that was from Washington. And to do that, and that's what Franklin dreamed about too. And, and to do that, they believed they needed both Republican virtue, as they call it, Republican virtues in the people and Republican future, uh, virtue in the leaders because they feared a demagogue a person like a Patrick Henry would be their example. Um, they feared that. They knew they were, Aaron Burr would be a later example. And they feared what that would do to a country. But they also knew that people needed virtue. That's why they supported public education. Think of what all Franklin did to um, motivate and create um, public education. They knew they needed a virtuous people. Indeed, when they left the Constitutional Convention, on the last day of the Con Continental Convention, uh, of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, Franklin gave a magnificent closing speech. And in it, he said, look, this isn't perfect. This won't last forever, he said about the Constitution. But it's the best we can have now. But this government, if the people lose virtue, it'll lead to tyranny like every other type of government. And in one of his first letters after he left Philadelphia, George Washington wrote much the same thing to his nephew Bushrod, who'd later become a member of the Supreme Court, that this constitution will only work as long as the people have virtue and the leaders have virtue. And that's what they brought to government. That's what they brought to the vision. That's what they brought to what they were trying to create because 
they knew how fragile a republic was. Fascinating. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Lindsay, tell us more about that powerful statement that both Franklin and Washington believe that the Republic would falter unless the people and the leaders have virtue. Um, uh, how did Washington uh, believe that people should cultivate the habits of virtue? Franklin famously proposed 13 virtues that all of us should follow every day, ranging from temperance to patience to humility. He got it from Pythagoras's golden virtue. He said that we should put check marks by them uh, to see how we've done every day. I've tried it. Uh, it's quite sobering actually to see how tough it is to <laughs> get the check mark. But um, uh, Washington uh, had circulated, although he didn't write famous rules for civility, which talked about how to conduct yourself. So obviously he cared a lot about this too. What were the classical sources that inspired Washington and how did he believe that people should cultivate this civic virtue, the habits of virtue? Sure. Well, Washington um, had a deep conviction that no person was ever fully formed. And so there needed to be a constant effort to improve yourself, to improve your education, to try and master your flaws, and to really, um, really see yourself as an ever evolving person. And so he certainly tried to live up to these standards through self-education. He was a avid reader. Um, constantly consuming news and trying to learn new things in really a variety of different fields, um, war, science, agriculture. Uh, he really enjoyed the theater. So he took in culture and um, fiction when it was recommended to him, like high quality fiction, like Don Quixote. Um, so he was constantly trying to improve who he was from a ideological perspective, but then also master what he knew to be his own um, shortcomings. And so his temper, of course, is one of the most famous examples. He worked really hard to keep his sort of natural temper in check with mixed results sometimes. Um, he learned to not make rash decisions. He learned to consult with people who had more knowledge than he did. He learned to be solicitous of those in civil government and not speak rashly to people who were, you know, his superiors. So there were things that he had to cultivate over a period of time, learned from his mistakes, and then tried to bring that knowledge into his next position. And he believed firmly that all citizens really needed to they weren't necessarily going to always meet his standards, but everyone needed to try and continue to better themselves as a nation, as a state, um, as a citizen. And a republic required that sort of dedication because they had seen countless examples that power was so easy to corrupt and it was so easy to go overboard. And so you needed to have citizens that were constantly trying to better themselves and were trying to um, sort of suss out their own weaknesses in order to maintain a republic. Thanks for all that. Ed, uh, give us a sense about whether Washington's exhortations to virtue, which he included in his uh, farewell address, uh, distinguished him from, for example, Madison, who was more determined to have constitutional checks that would ensure a successful government, even if men were not angels. And then give us a sense of the central uh, defining moments in Washington's character leading up to the presidency. You talked about several important periods where he and Franklin worked together from their opposition to the intolerable acts and the stamp acts and the other excesses of the British government, to their service in the Continental Congress, to their service on the War Council. Highlight a few of those and describe their effects on Washington's character and his conception of virtue. Highlighting what Lindsay just said, while she was talking, I don't know if anybody could see it, but I walked back to the shelf right behind me and pulled down the only book Washington ever wrote. It wasn't a book then, but Rules of Civility that uh, she was mentioning at the age of 14 to show what he was. Remember, at the age of 14, Washington wasn't, you know, didn't have very uh, great expectations. He was the, uh, the third son. And back when Virginia, everything was inherited by the first son. Mount Vernon was going to go to the first son. Not only was he third son, but he was the son by the second wife. And so he thought he'd have to make his own way. And so that's why he learned uh, surveying, went out in the frontier, thought, and this was important, thought the future would lie 
believed, Franklin believed the same thing. They both believed that what made America special and different from Europe was there was a frontier, that people wouldn't be trapped and controlled by a few great landowners, that they could go onto the frontier, they could make their own way, they could make their own fortune. Now, Franklin did that by experience, by leaving Boston where he was trapped in an indentured servant and going to Philadelphia, which was then the frontier and needed a printer and making his own way. Washington too went to the frontier and began surveying land. That's the time he, would, he wrote down these maxims and he borrowed them from a French maxim, um, a list of French maxims, and he wrote them all down by hand. The first one is every action done in company ought to be with the same sign as respect to those that are present. Respect, that was a key one. That was number one here. It goes on with all the rest. Both viewed the future in the frontier. Washington went there and he learned lessons on the frontier just as Franklin did. And then they were in two separate colonies. But by the time the French and Indian War comes, Franklin was, had already made his fortune and he moved into public service. And he had been elected to the state, uh, the, uh, the colonial legislature, and he had become the leader by sheer hard work, ability, and just native brilliance. He had become the leader of the opposition, the non Quaker government. Meanwhile, Washington, both of his brothers had died. He'd inherited Mount Vernon, and he also inherited the leadership of the Virginia militia. So when the French and Indian War came, the Quakers had to leave the government of Pennsylvania because they couldn't fight. And Franklin became the effective governor and was made, was given the authority to create a militia. Because what had happened is the French and Indian War was fought over what's called the Forks of the Ohio or the Ohio country, which then was Western Pennsylvania around Pittsburgh in that area, because the French had moved down in there and built a fort there and invaded what Pennsylvania considered their own land, but also Virginia did because their boundary was supposed to be the Potomac River going west. And so it, it resulted that both Virginia and Pennsylvania claimed what's now Pittsburgh. Well, the French were there. So the, the, they, the French had roused up the Native Americans. They were attacking all settlers, both from Pennsylvania and Virginia. And so Franklin had to go west leading the troops, and he turns out to be really good at it, to build a line of forts and defend Pennsylvania. Washington has to go west as head of the militia and defend what is now Western Pennsylvania. And so they started to work together. Both worked with Braddock when Braddock went into his defeat. Both warned Braddock, don't do it. These Native Americans are just gonna cut you to slices, which they did. Fra famously, Braddock said back to Franklin, oh, they may cut your, your poor, colonial militia to slices, but they won't know how to beat up British army. They did, including Braddock, who Washington carried back and buried under the road traveled by Franklin's wagons. So here, here we had the two people working together then, and they realized we can only win by working together. These states, these colonies can't work independent. They have to work together. And they also learned that you can't trust the British. They don't care about us. They only care about themselves. And so after the war, they drew a proclamation line and said, you, you can't settle in the West. Well, this is really what sets Franklin and Washington off because they thought public virtue would come by people having economic freedom, economic opportunity, political freedom, political opportunity, and that was the frontier. And if you lose that, you lose what makes America special. And so from right from the get-go, they had fought for that. They thought we needed to unify. These colonies couldn't do it alone. And so they learned together at the French and Indian War, the need for Americans to band together. And that's when Franklin drew his famous cartoon, the first political cartoon ever drawn in America, the unite or die with the, with the rattlesnake cut up into pieces. That was, this is interesting. That was published in his paper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, the first political cartoon drawn into America. But if you look at the page, if you look at the picture, what surrounds it is Washington's account of his trip, trip west to fight the French. They're, they're all together. And so they continue together. They bring that knowledge that we need unity. We need people with economic and po 
opportunity and political freedom. We need virtue. And they brought that to the Revolutionary War, where they were the two indispensable Americans. Of course, Washington leading the troops. Franklin proposed that he lead the troops. And Franklin and Franklin oversaw the war committees until he was sent to, to uh, France. Then he oversaw the, um, uh, the uh, alliance with France. He orchestrated it, he brought it about. And then he orchestrated sending the troops. He had to work with Washington to know, where is the French Navy needed? Where is the French army needed? Uh, Yorktown wouldn't have happened if he hadn't arranged for the, the uh, French Navy and French army. And Washington brought down the American army to capture uh, Cornwallis in Yorktown. So they worked hand in glove so that when, after the revolution, after Franklin comes back, he's elected governor of Pennsylvania three terms. He's like, he's almost 80. He's older than Joe Biden and he gets elected back then when people lived shorter times and he gets elected governor of Pennsylvania and he's fabulous at the job. The, the state was in trouble before him. He knows how to make it work. And then of course, they're both, Washington from Mount Vernon, Franklin from his seat as governor of Pennsylvania, pushed for a constitutional convention because they saw America collapsing without unity, without unified uh, uh, commerce, without a central government controlling the Western frontier. That was so important to both of them because until you had a central government, the ability to, to raise troops and to raise funds and to project our armies, open up the frontier, what was happening is no state had an interest in protecting the frontier and the Native Americans were moving back. They'd retaken the Ohio country, they'd retaken the forts of the Ohio, they had retaken two thirds of Georgia. And so it was these needs of a unified, of, of, of opening the frontier, of maintaining the frontier, of having a central government controlled over foreign policy and a central government able to, to um, raise taxes and spend money for the common welfare and also control interstate commerce. Franklin and Washington, because they both had run businesses that crossed state lines, they knew that was essential to create a place that would have a a growing economy, which was central to the people's virtue and to protect critical freedom and not have individual states go off in tangents like Rhode Island and Georgia were. So these are what they brought together and what, what drew them together to Philadelphia. And so when George Washington comes to Philadelphia for the Continental, for the Constitutional Convention, the very first place he goes after dropping off his bags at Robert Morris's house was to make a, to visit Franklin. And they sat down there under that mulberry tree in front of his house and they discussed what they needed to do to make a more perfect union. Oh, that is great. You've given us so much to think about taking Washington and Franklin up from the French and Indian War all the way to the Constitutional Convention. You begin your great book by describing that scene of Washington deciding you imagine not to drive up to Franklin's house because afterward he was accompanied by enslaved people. Franklin did not approve of slavery by that point, although Washington did. And he thought it would have more Republican simplicity to walk to his home. And you, and you take from all those experiences, this powerful shared devotion to a strong central government, a strong commerce power to keep the West open to, and to ensure economic independence in the people that would promote civil virtue. Uh, great. Lindsay, um, I'd love you to uh, give us your insights on that broad period from your uh, remarkable and helpful perspective. You can, you can take us up through the same period. Ed uh, didn't talk as much about the revolutionary uh, uh, war and exactly how Franklin and Washington joined together on the War Council, but um, focusing on Washington, bring us through the Constitutional Convention and in your view, what were the central experiences that shaped his devotion to strong central uh, federal power and to uh, civic virtue? Sure. So, I mean, Washington, I think, has to be really understood as someone that has a military mindset. And because most of his leadership up until the presidency was in a military capacity. Um, sure, he had sat in the House of Burgesses, but he wasn't particularly known for 
um, his oral speaking abilities. And so he would frequently sit back and listen to other people, but where he really took charge was on the battlefield. And that really shaped who he was because he spent eight years with the army and he only went home to Mount Vernon once and it was on the way down to Yorktown. So he really was with the army every day, except for when Congress called him to wherever they happened to be um, working at that moment for an update. And so he saw day in and day out the lack of food, the lack of shoes. When people say, you know, the people had bloody feet, that is not an exaggeration. Um, the lack of materials, the lack of food for horses, the lack of ammunition. And he felt very strongly that, and this is a direct quote, that they were expecting him to build bricks without straw. And so he became convinced that whether it be fighting a war or leading a nation, there needed to be a strong central authority. And he writes a letter at the end of the war to the different governors of each state, basically saying, we need to work together to try and improve the strong central authority. It needs to be centralized. We can't be having these ad hoc committees. We can't be having six people holding this authority. It doesn't work, people tend to argue. And I think he really had that deep conviction through the end of the war. And then it was his time during the Confederation after the war, sort of the in-between period, where he becomes convinced that Congress isn't the right body to hold that authority because they tend to bicker, congressmen come and go, there's a lack of institutional knowledge. Uh, a committee has a difficult time making a decision because one person can move more quickly and more efficiently and the economy is in shambles. Diplomacy is a mess because the Western regions have different goals than New England and the Southern regions. Um, they all kind of want different things. They're bickering over defense expenses because Eastern regions feel like Western settlers are provoking conflict with Native Americans and they don't wanna to have to pay for their defense. So by the end of 1787, sections are actually threatening to secede and break off and form their own nation. And this terrifies Washington because he had just spent eight years trying to ensure that there would be one nation, not six or you know however many sections there might be. And so he becomes convinced that the executive is the best place to have energetic authority. And when I say energetic, I mean, someone who can make a decision and then pursue policy and implement that quickly and um, strategically and with authority. And he feels like Congress is just not well equipped to act in that way. And so by the time he gets the Constitutional Convention, he very much believes that there needs to be a strong executive. And um, he was a very astute political mind. He understood that that was going to be him, which is one of the reasons that I think he was sort of procrastinating about going to the convention and was sort of reluctant to go initially and, and knew what was coming once he was there, if it was going to be successful and there was going to be a single executive, he and everyone else there knew it was going to be him. Um, but he believed that he alone really could fill that position because he was the most, I would argue he's the most famous man in the world. Maybe Ed would want to disagree with me um, about Franklin, but um, I would argue Washington was the most famous man in the world. He was younger than Franklin, so he was sort of better equipped to lead the nation in this way. And he was one of the few people that could actually bring the states together. And so he felt a sense of purpose and duty, um, not because he wanted to be president. I don't think he did. I think he felt like he had to be, otherwise the nation wouldn't work. Many thanks uh, for that and for noting his reluctance to attend the convention but the centrality of his attendance, because as you've noted, if he weren't there, the thing would not have succeeded. It was his, his, his actual presence that, uh, and, and the knowledge that he would serve as the first president that created the unity necessary to ensure the convention's success. Ed, talk about Franklin and Washington's contribution to the convention. They didn't say much. Uh, Washington hardly spoke. Franklin famously said at the end, I've always wondered if the chair was a rising or a setting sun. Now I think it's rising. Franklin did, as you know, have a greater role behind the scenes, especially in helping to broker the Connecticut compromise between the large states and small states that led to the balance of the House and the Senate. But I, I guess focusing on, on, on Washington in particular, because he's our, uh, our, our central hero here, what were his constitutional contributions to the convention? I agree very much with how Lindsay set it up. 
uh, he believed in a strong executive, uh, a democratically elected executive, one who would serve with terms that would be limited. But he did believe in the need for a strong executive, which is the one of the two places really that he disagreed, that Franklin disagreed with him. Franklin had written the Constitution of Pennsylvania, which has a weak executive and a strong legislature. But when Franklin was governor, by the strength of his character and will, he made it work because everybody listened to him. Now, that was the situation we have going into the convention. You have these two, and I would, I, I agree with Lindsay that Washington was one of the most famous people in the world. Um, I believe he, he and Franklin were co-equal in that respect. They both were the two universally respected people in America. And if you read every argument for ratification, you can, it doesn't matter whether it's from Georgia or New Hampshire, they all said, well, if Franklin and Washington gave us this, or if Washington and Franklin gave it this, we got to ratify it. They were the two people who were essential to make it work. Now, they agreed on the big things. They agreed on a strong central government. They agreed on the central government have a power over interstate commerce because they didn't want the states fighting with each other on commerce. They believed on the central government having power over the military and over diplomacy and over the frontier, all the big things they agreed on. Um, and they did differ. What Franklin said more at the, con he said quite a bit at the convention, but both of them were so committed to this working that both Washington and Franklin were constantly, both of them, having meetings, meeting with people afterwards at their homes or where Franklin was Washington was staying or at the inns and lodges they were staying at. They were both brokering compromises because as central to their character, both of them believed in compromise. Both of them believed that we don't compromise on principle, but we compromise on means. As Lindsay greatly said, yeah, Washington wasn't a great public speaker, either was Franklin. They both listened more than they spoke. They both loved to give credit to others rather than take all the credit themselves. Both were famous about that. Both of them wrote it down as virtues of sharing credit, of working like a team. They both in collegiality, working together. That's why Franklin always worked with the council. That's why Washington wanted the cabinet. They, this was their character. Now, they did differ, disagree strongly on, on how much power the president would have because they, Franklin feared that you give too much power to any one branch or any one person, that person will become a tyrant. And so he joins with a couple other key leaders. Uh, uh, Elderberg Jerry from Massachusetts um, uh, was key. Uh, Randolph of Virginia, uh, George Mason of Virginia, the four of them constantly were arguing for a weaker presidency um, they pushed for and Franklin got things like the power of impeachment because he he thought that was essential. Um, they put um, pushed for term limits and for all sorts of things like this, but they didn't get it all. And so the other three, and this is important, the other three vote no. Um, uh, Mason voted no, Randolph voted no, because they both voted no from Virginia. It was only Washington's vote that had the Virginia support the Constitution because it was three two because they both went the other way, and um, and Elderberg Jerry votes no. But Franklin in that famous last speech, which surprised some people, said, "I'm voting yes because this is better than what we have now. What we have now is going to lead to chaos, collapse, and destruction, and I believe this government will be led well as long." because we know who the first person is. And as long as Washington is president, this is gonna be fine because he has civic virtue. But this could lead to tyranny in some other president. But we're gonna do it because we need Washington to set the standards, set the terms, set the precedents that will lead us for us. So Franklin had so much faith in Washington as a leader, even though they disagreed on slavery. He had so much faith in Washington's virtue that he supported the Constitution. And without his support, you know, there, there was no way. Indeed, if you look, the only things that get out, the convention is secret. The only things that leak from the convention are Franklin's last speech, arguing why even a person who questions this should support it. 
and Washington's transmittal letter. And so when the people read the Constitution, they read it together with Washington's powerful transmittal letter and Franklin's final closing speech. They knew those two things leaked, and they leaked for a reason. Thanks for all that. And how interesting uh, to learn in your account of the fact that Franklin did side with the anti-federalists who refused to sign the Constitution with Randolph and Mason and Gary, as I've learned pedantically to pronounce it, and that it was Washington's support for a strong presidency at the final stages of the convention uh, at the expense of the Senate that laid the foundations for the modern presidency, as you put it, um, by throwing in his lot with Hamilton Wilson, Governor Morris, and the other supporters of the strong executive, and how important to note, as you do, that Washington's transmittal letters was so central and that uh, during ratification, his support in Virginia was crucial as well. And he declared in the aggregate is the best constitution that can be obtained in this epoca or epoca and said that the powers granted to Congress were indispensably necessary to perform the functions of good government. Lindsay, that brings us up to the presidency of Washington and the subject of your important new book. And in your book, you argue that the constitution itself did not establish a presidential candidate. In fact, the delegates to the convention explicitly rejected the idea. Tell us how and why Washington created one of the most powerful bodies in the federal government, why he waited two and a half years uh, to call a cabinet, and what the models for his cabinet were uh, dating back to his service in the councils of war that he led as commander of the Continental Army. Sure. So, um... As you noted, uh, there the word cabinet doesn't actually exist in the Constitution, and the delegates to the Constitutional Convention definitely deba debated this concept. They knew that a president needed advice, no president ever leads alone, and so they knew that there needed to be people to provide support and assistance, but they were very worried about a cabinet because they had just come from declaring independence from Great Britain, and they felt that that sort of council would lead to corruption, it would lead to cronyism, it hid transparency at the highest levels of government. So it kind of obscured who was responsible for each decision. And they really didn't want to implement that sort of system into the new government. And so they put in place two different alternatives. One, the president could request written advice from the department secretaries. Um, and these, these two provisions are in Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution. The president could request written advice from the department secretaries on matters pertaining to their department. And this was crafted very carefully because it demonstrates their desire to have basically a paper trail, a chain of evidence about what people were advising to presidents and who was saying what and who was advocating for each position. And if the opinions are all written, then you have the documentation. Um, and they also wanted advisors to stick to their area of expertise. They didn't want advisors bloviating about every single topic. Instead, they wanted the president to be getting detailed, concise, um, well-established advice from people who had experience in these areas. The second option that they gave was the Senate. And unlike today, when the Senate sort of serves as a rubber stamp on treaties or appointments or rejects them out of hand, the Senate was intended to be basically a council on foreign affairs and provide advice to the president when he was considering issues of diplomacy. Now, of course, the Senate was much smaller at the time, so it's not 100 people trying to provide advice. But that was really their expectation because the Senate was indirectly elected. So it was at least somewhat responsible to states. It could be held accountable for the advice that they were giving. And so when Washington went into the presidency, he, as Ed said, he was there every day. He was socializing with all of the other delegates. He was having tea and going to the theater and listening to music. So he had a very clear expectation of what they had decided about the advisors. Um, he had been listening. And so he went into the presidency attempting to really follow these rules. And he, he visits with the Senate in August of 1789, and it goes very badly because the Senate was acting like a legislative body. They wanted to deliberate. They wanted to talk about it in committee. And Washington was a military man. He wanted that efficient advice. He wanted answers right away. 
So just a couple of months into his presidency, all of a sudden this option isn't really working for him. And he decides that he's not going to go back to the Senate to request advice. And he quickly discovers that written advice isn't really effective either because, you know, today when we're exchanging emails with people, sometimes we'll have another question and we'll forget that we wanted to ask it so we can just send another email or maybe tone isn't properly conveyed. But now try and imagine doing that with parchment and quill. And it takes a long time to write out the letter. It takes a long time to let it dry. Then you have to have it delivered. Then they have to write their response. And these are serious matters of state and they're complicated issues. And Washington was frustrated that letters were moving too slowly. So he starts having, he'll exchange a letter or two. And then he started inviting his secretaries over for individual consultations to sort of have some follow-up discussion. And did that for about two and a half years. And the first cabinet meeting didn't actually take place until November 26th, 1791. So two and a half years into Washington's administration, which is really important because it shows that it wasn't there from day one or wasn't what anyone really expected. Um, And as you mentioned, Washington really drew on his council of war experience to shape these interactions in the cabinet because it was the leadership experience that he knew, and it is what worked really well for him during the war. Um, thank you for that. It's a important story. It has not been told before and tying Washington's war service to this crucial institution that he created during the presidency, which as you say, does not appear in the constitution, um, is, uh, has illuminated us all. Uh, I think we have, um, well, we have 20 questions in the Q&A box Beautiful. and they're so good that it's time to start um, asking them. <clears throat> and let's, because uh, there are so many, let's try to get through as many as possible. So I'll offer them to uh, different ones of you. And the, the very first question is, uh, uh, Professor Larson, love your books. By the way, please remind us why President Washington stepped down after eight years, just two terms, and did it set a precedent? It did set precedent. And it's a great question because I think more than anything that reflects his virtue, his Republican virtue. He believed that uh, you took office by the call of the people and you rule by the call of the people. Now he wasn't a strong presidency, but that's, we've got to remember mixed with that was this belief he served as a call of the people. He had done the same thing when he was a military leader. He vowed that when the revolution was over, he vowed at the beginning that he would step down Oh, the opponents would say, oh, look, look, the British said, look, why are you changing one George for another? You have George III now, and now you're going to get King George Washington. Look at every rebel leader, Cromwell or Caesar, they all become dictators. Washington said, no, I'm going to step down. And so that created the Cincinnati myth or the Cincinnati story from the Roman leader of Cincinnati, who had stepped down after saving Rome twice. And so Washington does it at the end of the revolution and is convinced he needs to do it again as president to not have the sense of a lifetime president that rather this president is called out of the people to serve and then go back. Franklin thought the same way. He went out and back in and out. And that was set that standard. And he believed he believed everything he was doing was setting a precedent. Hamilton believed that, so did Governor Morris, so did the key advisors. He believed he was setting a precedent and that precedent then lasted up until World War II and Franklin Roosevelt. And then as soon as Franklin Roosevelt broke it, then the the states and Congress passed a constitutional, constitutional amendment to enshrine it in our constitution, the Washington way, two terms, that's it. Thanks very much for that. There are several questions about virtue. Uh, uh, Michael uh, Benefiel asked, virtue may have been an aspiration for both Franklin and Washington, but they were sufficiently skeptical to wish to aspire to virtue and guard against vice. Would you agree? Uh, We also have uh, a question about whether uh, their conception of virtue in Washington's in particular in the lifelong quest for self-improvement see them both lives Was it grounded in religious faith or fidelity of the enlightenment value of reason? I'll ask uh, whether the uh, stoic or classical value of reason was uh, part of it as well. And then of course, uh, there's a question about how uh, Franklin was more 
colorful in his personal life than, than Washington. His uh, personal life was beyond reproach and uh, how central was this conception of virtue to shaping this exemplary character that made him so influential? And Lindsay, I'll let you take all, all three of those about, about Washington and, and Franklin and virtue. Sure, um, lots of questions about virtue, um, which is great because I think it's something that we're seen as a really important part of politics and we want our politicians to be virtuous, especially in times of crisis, crisis like we're facing today. Um, I think that Washington was not a particularly religious person. He had a deep sense that there was some sort of providence. Um, how And it, it wasn't providence like God, like we think of today. It was providence like a sense of fate almost. Um, but he had a conviction that he had a certain role that he was destined to play. And so he had to better himself to be able to fill that role and fulfill that destiny. Um, so I don't think it's a particularly biblical approach to virtue, but it's more of a, a deep sense of who he was supposed to become. Um, in terms of his personality, he definitely wasn't as outwardly colorful as Franklin. Um, but that didn't mean that he was boring. And we tend to think of him as like the marble bus or you know the picture on the $1 bill. And that's not really who he was. He had a lot of passions. He loved to read, he loved the theater, he loved music, he loved dancing, um, he loved riding horses, he loved dogs. Um, and these are the things that make up who he was just like our passions make up who we are today. Um, he also had a great sense of humor, which is sometimes underappreciated. One of my favorite Washington stories is um, after he retired, he went home and they had these big meals almost every day because he was hosting guests every day that were coming to see him. And um, his favorite hound was a big hound named Vulcan. And one day Vulcan came in and basically stole the ham that was sitting on the dining room table and dragged it out of the room and ran outside with it. And Martha was furious because she had ordered this dinner prepared and Washington thought it was hysterical and just burst out laughing and absolutely thought it was the funniest thing. And I love telling that story because one, it shows that he loved dogs, which I love dogs too, but it shows that he was actually this real person and, and he enjoyed humorous things. Wonderful, thank you for that. If I um, can read- let me, let me just, you, you can know, add to any of that, but I do want to put two more questions on the table just to get as many of them as possible. And they're both about Washington and slavery. Uh, Robert by uh, email asks, throughout his life, George Washington owned slaves and while in Philadelphia, he maneuvered to retain his slaves and tried to recapture those who escaped. Is there any evidence of efforts made in Philadelphia to change his views on slavery and slave owning? And Vani uh, Zedek asks, how strongly did Franklin push his position of anti-slavery on Washington and in what setting, such as the Constitutional Convention, did Franklin speak up about slavery? So Ed, why don't you take both of those and, and add whatever else you, you'd like. These are great questions, uh, both of them. And that certainly was uh, the Achilles heel for Washington, because as your people, as these questioners ask, Franklin was pushed on being a model to oppose slavery. Remember, Franklin had become the president of the first abolitionist society in America. Franklin was taking the lead in opposing, the, calling for the end of slavery. He was working worldwide with abolitionist leaders in France and in England to abolish slavery. Pennsylvania, first state to abolish slavery. Washington, of course, comes there as president. Now, he pressed Washington, but more importantly, so did so many of his advisors, Hamilton, uh, Lafayette, uh, 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 Lawrence. They all pressed press Washington during the revolution. Please release your own slaves, make a statement against slavery, be like Franklin, and you and Franklin are the leaders. You can set a model for it, and Washington always equivocated. That's the word for it. He, he's pained by it. He's pained when he talks to them. And when it comes time to the Constitutional Convention, Franklin is head of the is governor of the state, but also head of the abolition society. He's pressed by the society to push for the abolition of slavery at, at the convention. He clearly talks with Washington about it. But what Franklin decides is the Constitution won't go through. Uh, uh, the Carolinas, Virginia, uh, Georgia, they'll bolt. We need to make a stronger federal union and once we have it, that federal union then can work to abolish slavery because it will have the power to do it. And so when the, con 
then when the first government is formed, the first thing Franklin does is submit petitions calling on Congress to end slavery. And those petitions completely stop government for weeks as they have to debate the slavery issue raised by Franklin. And Washington is furious. We know his private letters because he wants to keep the country going. He thinks we have to go further along this route. And so Franklin is just venting in private that, that Franklin has done this, but still, um, Thanks to Madison, the manipulator, those petitions are buried after a while, after some debate. Franklin goes to his grave, but Washington has the last word. In his, in his will, he frees his own slaves. Washington, because he wasn't a great speaker, just as Lindsay pointed out, he often led by his actions, such as retiring, uh, led by his actions as a, as, a, as a leader of the troops. And here he's trying to lead, I believe, by the action of freeing his slaves at his death, because that he hopes to send a message. It doesn't work, it's too late, but that's where Washington ends it. Franklin is pushing for it. And that's one of their last, that's their last interaction. And it's a, it's a divisive one, but it's how it ended. So that's where they stand on slavery. And of course, as Franklin warned in a, in, a, in a speech read by Governor Morris at the convention, th it's slavery that's going to tear this union apart. They realized it. Thanks for all that and for addressing that crucial uh, series of questions. Uh, Lindsay Charon asks, uh, uh, Lindsay Ch uh, Chavritsky, um, did Washington solicit advice from anyone else when choosing the first members of his cabinet? And then I'll just add as well, this great question from uh, Nancy Hart. Washington is such an incredible figure. Who were his mentors who helped shape himself as a person? Good. Great questions. Um, yes, Washington absolutely did um, ask for advice about who he should appoint in his cabinet. He had a couple of um, key uh, considerations. It was very important to him to represent different regions and interests in the nation. And so he made sure that Hamilton represented the New York merchant trade, um, industry, urban perspective. Knox ha was making his home up in Maine. Um, Edmund Randolph and Thomas Jefferson, of course, came from Virginia, but they also had a lot of different backgrounds. They had a lot of different experiences. They had the type of expertise that they could provide him with a different perspective. And this is a precedent that a lot of people don't appreciate that uh, presidents that followed him really continue to follow this model. And of course, the idea of what interests and what people should be represented in that in that image has expanded and become more diverse. Um, but he did he did ask for recommendations. Madison was really instrumental in getting him to choose Jefferson as his Secretary of State. Um, as Ed, I think, said earlier, uh, Robert Morris was very close with Washington. They were good friends, but Robert Morris sort of demurred and said he didn't want to be the Secretary of the Treasury and really encouraged Hamilton as the next choice. Um, and it was really important to Washington that he had a personal relationship with all of these people already. So Hamilton was a natural second choice because they had had this wartime relationship. Uh, Jefferson and Washington knew each other well. Edmund Randolph was an aide-de-camp early in the war, was Washington's um, private attorney for many uh, decades prior to coming into office. And Henry Knox was, of course, one of his favorite officers, and they were close really immediately from 1775. So um, he had these different considerations and asked for people's advice, and then whoever fit that image or those different um, values, he was, he was amenable to appointing. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you for all that. Well, it's time for very brief closing thoughts in this absolutely wonderful discussion. And I'll, I'll just tee it up with a question I asked Lindsay when she appeared on the podcast, and I'm interested in your thoughts too. And it'll, uh, this is the question. Um, in his wonderful novel, Democracy, Henry Adams has a great scene where uh, Madeline Lee, who's uh, the hero, takes a boat trip to Mount Vernon. And she's having a debate with a British nobleman uh, about whether or not George Washington was overrated. And uh, some of the participants say that he actually was a paragon of virtue and others say that he was a paper saint. And Madeline Lee decides that the meaning of America turns on whether Washington was 
a saint or not. Uh, the, the stakes are nothing less than whether the American idea is real or is a lie. So Ed, if you had to take sides in this debate, uh, what, what would your answer be? And what do you want our great audience to uh, leave with um, about the central uh, virtue of George Washington? The, the story of Washington, of course, when people look back at Washington right after his death, we're talking about right away. Um, what's the story? Parson Weems, the story of, I cannot tell a lie. I cannot tell a lie. Now, that's a story. It, it didn't actually happen, but it's a story that Americans believed. And what it captures is the need that Americans need to be, needed to believe that Washington was not a lie that Washington was not uh, a, a paper figure, that he really was fundamentally a saint. And that goes for Franklin too, who's worshiped. You know, his autobiography is the best-selling book of the 19th century, worshiped by so many people. These people, our founding fathers, have to have a cert, certain sense, particularly Washington and Franklin, have to have this, this believability, this sense of truth. And I think Frank, I think Washington was that way. I think Washington was fundamentally honest. He didn't, he, 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 he dealt straight with people. He was honest. And that sort of honesty in government, he admitted his limitations. He knew he wasn't. He knew he wasn't infallible. That's why he used a cabinet. That's why he drew on others. But that sense of virtue and character, he had to not only project it, he had to live it. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Lindsay, last word to you. You had a chance to think about the Henry Adams question. Uh, was Washington a paragon of Roman virtue or a paper saint or something in between? Yeah, I kind of want to stand by my original answer. I think that he, um, you know, he was neither and both. And that's what the nation is. It's this great idea and this great possibility and a great experiment, but of course is continues to be deeply flawed. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's not incredible potential for for innovation and growth and improvement. And as we've talked a lot about today, um, that's what Washington wanted to pursue himself was constant betterment. And so um, what better legacy to actually leave for the nation than constantly wanting to be better and be more virtuous and improve. Thank you so much, uh, Lindsay Chervinsky and Ed Larson for a superb launch of our National Constitution Center's uh, virtual town hall series. Uh, friends, we have uh, a series of great programs coming up, including on April 6th, the constitutional legacy of the Warren Court. On April 20th, why does the Electoral College exist? That's a great debate. Uh, <laughs> I know that you'll love hearing both sides. April 23rd, how to fix presidential elections in 2020 and beyond. Don't we all want to know how to do that? And I'm sure uh, that'll be a great discussion. And April 28th, how to restore trust in America's institutions. That's Yuval Levin's excellent new book. Um, thank you all, most, most of all, for taking time out of your days and evenings in these anxious times, these challenging times, to educate yourself about the Constitution, to cultivate your faculties of reason, to learn and grow. Let us use the time that we have, the leisure time, to continue to educate ourselves and let's do it together. And the National Constitution Center stands ready to convene great thinkers like Lindsay and Ed so that we can learn together. Lindsay, Ed, thank you so much for joining and National Constitution Center friends, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much, this was so fun. Thank you. Thank you.